part one, an envelope containing poison. In the long life of Louis XIV, the Sun King, there were three main interests, women, war, and the Chateau of Versailles. He suffered a few minor setbacks with the first two. With the third, he created what, as a young man, he'd resolved to create, a chateau which would be the talk and the hub of the universe. The minor setbacks over women and war? Well, women. In the fullness of time, Madame de Montespan, one of his leading mistresses, grew disappointingly fat and blousy. And on getting out of her carriage to play her part in the Siege of Gaunt in 1678, whatever part that was, was seen, in spite of two or three hours of massage each day, to have legs each the size of a comparatively thin man. She also became rather grubby. She also took energetically to religion, and in due course, she had to go. Madame la Marquise, you have become devout. I have, monsieur. Like my rival with the king's favors, Madame de Maintenant, I am filled with sadness and horror at the very sight of Versailles. This is what is called the world. This is where all the passions are at work. Love of money, ambition, envy, and dissipation. Oh, oh, how happy are those who have put the world behind them. Those being your views, madame, it will cause you no distress to learn that the king has given orders that you are to leave the apartment you occupy next to his here in Versailles. Monsieur le Cordonnier, why were you chosen to tell me this? I obey His Majesty's orders, madame. And those of your sister, Madame de Maintenon, who was once my friend, then my rival, and who has now taken my place as the king's mistress, or one of them. Madame la Marquise is aware of His Majesty's wishes, madame. Where am I to go? You are to be granted accommodation in the apartment of the Bang, madame. No doubt, because my enemies at the court say I do not approve of soap and water. Oh, God, I wish I was dead. I hope when that day comes, madame, you will have made sure of marrying God, not just living in it. <laughs> like your sister, monsieur, whom I brought to this court to look after the first son I had by the king, the Duke de Maine. He was born paralyzed in his left leg. She seems to cure that, though he still walks with a limp. She seems to have succeeded in many other matters. When I spoke of marrying God, and you said, like my sister, what exactly did you mean, madame? To Madame de Maintenon, as to me, and to a great many others, the king was God. Uh, well, at least, and at last, Madame la Marquise de Maintenon and I have two things in common. And what are they, madame? Mm -hmm. We both, monsieur, have had the pleasure of being the king's mistress. And we both, monsieur, have ended up suffering from migraine. And your sister, monsieur, brought on mine. As for the occasional setbacks in war, well, uh, Holland irritated the king even more than the development of Madame la Marquise de Montespan's legs or her growing grubbiness. This ill feeling no doubt began when Louis, as a very young man, offered his infant daughter Marie Anne to be the wife of William of Orange and was snubbed. Sire, His Royal Highness Prince William of Orange, hereditary shareholder of the United Netherlands, says, um, um, well, says what? That in the House of Orange, one marries the legitimate daughters of kings, not their bastards. Thank you. You will be escorted back to Holland. When the time is right, I shall doubtless follow you. With my army. Louis, smarting for years after this rebuff, almost conquered Holland. Had he done so, no doubt he would have given the Dutch an unpleasant time. But when he and his army were within sight of Amsterdam, the Dutch opened their dike gates, and this uh, considerably dampened the expedition's ardor. In a way, it's odd. The king's favorite flower was the tulip, and when he wasn't actually fighting the Dutch, he ordered four million bulbs a year from their nurseries for his new gardens in Versailles. 
and there were certainly no setbacks in his plans for the Chateau of Versailles. Quarrels, disagreements, changes of plans, yes. But in his early 20s, Louis had resolved that what had been his father's little hunting lodge would be transformed into the most glorious chateau in France. The resolve may well have first come to him when, at the age of 23, he was invited to a housewarming party given in his honour by Nicolas Fouquet. It was uh, quite a housewarming party. There were 6,000 guests. I have never known such an occasion. Oh, such opulence. How can Monsieur Fouquet afford it? He is more than adequately married. He would require to be to pay for all this. He married Marie de Castille only ten years ago. She was very wealthy then. And it's said that in those ten years, Fouquet has tripled her wealth. When one thinks of it, the last time I drove past here in my carriage, what is the place called? No, Belle Vicomte. It was green fields and cattle. And a few peasants, miserable little cottages. With the compliments and of Monsieur Fouquet, madame. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, with the compliments of Mrs. Fouquet, madame. Oh, it's a diamond tiara. The one of the most beautiful I have ever seen. Uh, Monsieur Fouquet will be extremely pleased, madame. Uh, madame, uh, with the compliments of Monsieur Fouquet. Oh, you mean we're all being presented with diamond tiaras? Uh, Monsieur Fouquet, madame, is anxious to make his first reception a memorable occasion for his guests. Uh, the gentleman guest star, I presume, as is the custom, ignore. Uh, no, Monsieur Le Comte, on leaving when naturally carriages have been provided for you all, you will be presented with a thoroughbred. A thoroughbred what? Stallion, Monsieur Le Comte. Uh, uh, Monsieur Fouquet acquired them from one of the most famous studs in Arabia. He has arranged for grooms to conduct them to wherever you wish them to be seen. Uh, madame, uh, with the confidence of Monsieur Le Comte, Words fail me. And that, my dear Charles, has not happened to you for a very long time. <laughs> oh, look, Fouquet is showing his majesty some of his treasures. I cannot decide whether the king is impressed or just him. <laughs> the Italian influence, your majesty, no, but for the first time have you blended with the best in contemporary French taste. No one, sire, is more proud to be French or to be one of your majesty's most devoted subjects than I. But I feel in art we can learn much from the Italians. Now, this, your majesty, is by Giotto. It cost, naturally, a great deal of money. Very beautiful. And the various marbles, your majesty, these covering the ballroom floor are from Carrara, and those below the balcony come from India, a quarry in Macrana. Your majesty approves? His majesty said, no doubt partly under his breath, looks, looks, and so is Meaning that the whole thing was all very splendid, but ostentatious and more than a little common. He then got down to business, and even as a young man, he could be extremely businesslike. Monsieur Fouquet, Your Majesty, eight years ago, in 1653, you were appointed superintendent of finance. <laughs> that is so, Your Majesty, in consequence of my not even considerable experience. And you are now also procureur general? I was appointed to that position, Your Majesty, no doubt also because I had considerable legal so, experience. Isn't it? In these two positions, you are able to carry out financial transactions without shall we say, investigation? <laughs> you have been borrowing on the public purse for your own personal credit. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> the wars, Your Majesty. The long wars. It has been found from time to time necessary. I know the wars are long, Monsieur Fouquet. Some of us, myself included, have to fight them. You're a clever man, Monsieur Fouquet, <laughs> and unscrupulous. I know what your ambition is. I know too what your emblem is. It is a squirrel climbing higher and higher up a tree. No doubt a family tree. You wish by intrigue to become head of my government. You will not achieve that ambition, Monsieur Fouquet. It has been the most delightful housewarming. I have been greatly impressed by all that I have seen. But as is most evident by all we have been shown here tonight, the squirrel has been nibbling too long at the country's nuts. It will climb no higher. You are being placed under arrest, Monsieur Fouquet, for embezzlement. Fouquet was clapped into jail in the fortress of Perignon, and after that, very few people in Paris gave ostentatious housewarming parties for the king. Louis, the sun king, 
even though his sun was just starting to ascend, already shone strongly. Louis XIV, the Grand Monarch, was born in 1638. He came to the throne at the age of five, like his successor, Louis XV, 72 long years later. Too long, it's been said, for the good of France. He was tall and dark, not really handsome. He had an imposing nose, which only in old age became recognisably Jewish. He almost certainly had both Jewish and Moorish blood in him. He married, against his will, Marie Therese of Spain, and as a youth was governed by his mother, Queen Anne of Austria, and by a certain Cardinal Mazuwa, who was probably his mother's lover, if not her husband. He was, in any case, excessively rich, even for a cardinal. Louis tactfully kept his earliest mistresses sotto voce from his mother, which was decent of him. He was a Bourbon, as well as an Abaddon, and the family tree of both is an amazing succession of illegitimacies. Never have there been more branches, twigs, or suckers. He had an early semi-permanent mistress, Louise de la Vallière, who blushed a great deal over her position, but when both the Queen and the Cardinal died, Louis set to on his one true love, Versailles. Ah, end of history lesson. Now, down to work, as Louis himself got down to it. He had four main experts to help him achieve his aim of making the Chateau of Versailles the most beautiful building in France. Monsieur Colbert, the accountant, Monsieur Lebrun, what we would now call an interior decorator, Monsieur Lebeau, the architect, and the charmer of the quartet, the only one who ever really answered the king back, Monsieur Lenotte who, his grandfather having spread manure for the Medici's, was born and bred to be a royal gardener. They met together a great deal, these four, as the new chateau took shape with growing enthusiasm, but to begin with, with grave doubts about the whole idea. We must be very firm, gentlemen. His Majesty is still young. He seems to have no conception of what this project is going to cost. You are in one of your frowning moods, Monsieur Colbert. Well, I'm an accountant, Monsieur Lebeau. Accountants have ample reason to frown. When the king was a boy, I taught him to keep accounts. He was the first king of France who had ever done such a thing. I made him write down how much money he got at the beginning of each year and then subtract his expenses from it. Oh, I admit that when the money ran out too soon, which it always did, usually around July, I borrowed some more for him from Cardinal Mazarin. But uh, if I may say so, it was at least a step in the right direction. Now he seems to have forgotten the lesson. An enormous royal residence built around this hunting lodge when he has the Louvre and all his other palaces. Well, Monsieur Le well, I think it's an admirable idea. Mm. You, Monsieur Le Brun, have been appointed official decorator if the scheme goes ahead. And you, Monsieur Le Beau, have been appointed official architect once again if it goes ahead. Of course you think it's an admirable idea. You'll both make a fortune and get a great deal of enjoyment in making it. I will travel the world by the finest of everything. Carpets, tents, glass, horses, silks, bouquets, chandeliers, marble. I'm sorry to disappoint you both, but you won't. If I cannot this morning dissuade His Majesty from going ahead with the project, at least, and if I may say so, I still have considerable influence over His Majesty, at least I can ensure that some of the money squandered on this new chateau comes back in time to France. In uh, what way, uh, Monsieur Colbert? I am, Monsieur, in charge of all building in this country. I alone, if I may say so, am capable of producing the enormous sum of money which the building of the chateau is going to swallow. But if His Majesty insists on going ahead, I am imposing a strict customs barrier. Nothing is to be brought into France that can be made in France. <laughs> the silks, the lace, the glass that we had to buy from Italy. The china, you can only procure really exquisite china from Germany. Think of the marble, Monsieur Colbert. When I worked on Monsieur Fouquet, former resident of Tony We will make everything here, gentlemen, here in France. Tapestries. China, silks, brocades, carpets, everything. There's a little carpet-making concern in Aubusson, which I feel we should encourage. It's been going on for over 200 years, but this could make it famous. And before very long, Italy and Germany and the rest will be buying from us. You seem very certain of your stand this morning, isn't you? I'm never certain of anything before meeting the king. I'm some 20 years older than me, but whenever I'm summoned to meet him here at Versailles, even though, if I may say so, I am alleged to be a person of some power, I am in awe of him. I take a piece of bread and throw it in the canal which runs beside my house in Scove. 
If it floats to the other side, it means that Louis will be in a good temper. If it just falls in the water and stays there, I know the session will be stormy. <laughs> You're very silent this morning, Mr. Lenotra. Mm. No. Well, I've been thinking. I suppose you'll want matches of flowers. I hate flowers. The royal gardener. Eh? It's an odd quirk. Well, I like trim lawns and hedges. And space. And, and plenty of water. And tall, well-shaped poplars with their thin triangles reflected in the water. I expect he'll want it all prettied up with millions of his Dutch tulips and all his other favourites. Orange blossom, Cuba roses, stocks, wallflowers, daffodils, jazz. If we go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, we are going ahead. Yes, yes. Pray be seated. Oh, how, how did your piece of bread, bread behave this morning, morning Monsieur Colbert? Colbert? Your Majesty knows. I was listening at the people. Everyone, Everyone else does? Why not the king? And how, how did, did it behave? It sank, sire. Like your hopes of dissuading me, it must have been very badly made. Ah, Lenore, how was your visit to Italy? I had an audience with the Pope, your majesty. So I heard. I also heard that when the audience was over, you gave His Holiness a great big hug. Well, it didn't surprise me. Whenever I come back from a journey, you give me a great big hug. Um, did you see any really superb gardens you might um, copy? Ah, there's one in Florence, Your Majesty, in the Borghese. Sloping lawns, trim new hedges, fountains, statues, plenty of water and space. Barely a flower in sight. It's beautiful. <laughs> well, now, Monsieur Lebrun, Monsieur Lebeau, the plans. I have them. Your Majesty. Mm. These are, of course, Your Majesty, only suggestions. Your Majesty, uh, Monsieur Colbert, before Your Majesty examines the plans, why Versailles? Because I like Versailles. I love Versailles. Ought not the Louvre to be a more fitting residence for Your Majesty? You are, sire, King of France. Paris is your capital. The Louvre should be your home. I'm a country person, Monsieur Colbert. I do not like to be cooped up indoors. If I have to be indoors, I wish to be able to see gardens and green fields and great masses of flowers. Is there not? No flowers. There is no town, Your Majesty. Nothing around you here except a few hamlets and one or two inns. Wherever the king decides to live, if, quoting yourself, Monsieur Colbert, I may say so, a town arrives. It springs up as well as the chateau. There will be a town called Versailles. And, and you, Monsieur Laveau, will, will see that it is properly planned and laid out. Your Majesty, it is unhealthy. I have never felt fitter in my life than here at Versailles. Oh, by the way, Lenore, I have decided to give you a coat of arms. Thank you, sir. I already have one. Three slugs on a bed of cabbage leaves. <laughs> <laughs> now, gentlemen, the plans. Hmm. Hmm. No. Where is the hunting lodge? My father's hunting lodge. The building we are sitting in at this moment. Where is it? Your Majesty. I gave you orders, Monsieur Laveau, that the new chateau was to be built around the hunting lodge. That it was to be wrapped around it carefully like an envelope. It makes things very difficult, Your Majesty. I do not care how difficult it makes things. You will overcome the difficulties. This lodge, sire, is built on a hill. The soil beneath it, sire, is... Mainly sand. I'm afraid, Your Majesty, it keeps shifting. And the more that is built around it, the more it will shift. Then you must find some means of stopping it shifting. The water supply, Your Majesty, is going to be a, a grave problem. Then you must also find ways of resolving that problem. Your Majesty, if you wish us to create... Majesty's most expert direction and advice in the finest palace in Europe. Why build it onto an existing building whose style has become... If your majesty will forgive me, I'm fashionable. I warn you, Monsieur Lebrun, and you, Monsieur Lebeau, if for any reason this old house disappears, it will immediately be built up again, brick by brick. Uh, yes, your majesty. I shall alter the plans, your majesty, to have the chateau built around the hunting lodge. Wrapped around it. Lovingly. Like an envelope that holds a love letter. Like an envelope. Now, now, let, let us, us see. see. Yes, that I like. A great courtyard. Plenty of space. You like it, Lenotra? 
You two are a believer in space. It looks good to me, Your Majesty. Not a flower bed in sight. <laughs> and there and there, in front of the main facade, you can plant great parterres and fill them with roses or in the spring tulips for the chambermaids to look at out of the top windows. Now, I do not like those two groups of buildings to the extreme left and right of the main courtyard. They look to me crowded. Pokey. Uh, what do you think, Monsieur Colbert? The less pokey they are, Your Majesty, the more they will cost. You think of nothing but money. Sometimes, Your Majesty, I contemplate the disappearance of it. No, Monsieur Lebrun. The main groups. Mm. Now, I want more green. Fresh, light green in all these rooms leading off the centre corridor. And your rooms are over decorated, Monsieur. You are a designer, not the curator of a museum. I, I wish this would be the greatest palace on earth. But it must be grand without being pompous. It must be full of life and air and cheerfulness. I have the feeling that, if God so decrees, I shall live to be an old man. But the shadow of Versailles must always be the home of a young man. Country. A happy house. Oh, you must go to work again, gentlemen. Do not worry. We shall overcome all the problems. I think I shall give a divertissement. We'll ask Molière to write something for the occasion to say goodbye to this old house. Not that we are really saying goodbye to it. It will remain there, Monsieur Le Port. There, in the centre, where it is now. You understand? Yes, Your Majesty. When the plans for the Shadow of Versailles were finally approved by Louis, the envelope, as he called it, became an enormous workshop. The little hunting lodge was covered in scaffolding, buried in dust. The gardens round it like a quarry, full of mud, stones, drain pipes, men and horses. Marble and bronze statues lay around, waiting for the king to say where he wanted them. He came over from Saint-Germain at least once a week, supervising operations, hanging a few pictures in the rooms that were completed, running round the gardens full of suggestions from Monsieur Lenoch, constantly changing his mind, driving the work to distraction, but issuing orders which, Louis being Louis, none dare disobey. He ordered several thousand fully grown forest trees to be planted, against the advice of Lenoch, who had the temerity to suggest that the trees, like women, when uprooted late in life, did not always settle down contentedly in their new surroundings. Half the trees died, and on the king's orders, were immediately replaced. What is it all going to cost? He demands green. Green, 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 green. And it is not been at all. It is cheap. Come on, come on. What has it been at all? Oh, you saw. He has not taken my advice. I have planned everything for the main rooms, embroidered velvet in winter, flowered silk in summer. But he has not worked out the essential things properly. When great crowds come here from Paris for the balls and fakes, there are just those few privies in the courtyard. I know what will happen. They'll relieve themselves of my staircase. No, he wants a trianon. A pavilion in blue and white porcelain. Oh, I don't mind that. But it's to be covered in blossoms. While all this work was going on, Louis held his divertissement for not a word but a bianto to his father's hunting lodge, now being wrapped up and sealed in its envelope. There were 300 guests, and Molière duly obliged with the world premiere of a piece called Georges Donda. The Queen was there, naturally. His accepted and acknowledged mistress, Louise de la Vallée, sat beside her, pregnant, again, naturally, melancholy and dull. And at a table not far away, there was a constant buzz of chatter and laughter from two of the liveliest ladies in Paris. It had been going on all evening, no doubt to the fury of Molière. It now becomes necessary to look into the Sun King's love life. To do so in any detail would take a very long time indeed. Throughout his long life, he had innumerable mistresses, countless bastards, and, let us be fair, let us be fair, one surviving legitimate child. Let us concentrate on the king's three principal love affairs, the pattern of which, oddly enough, was always the same. There was a great deal of gossip over an early affair with his sister-in-law, the Duchesse d'Orléans, and in the hope of stifling the gossip, 
The Duchesse d'Orléans told the king to pretend that he was courting not herself, but one of her ladies-in-waiting, Louise de la Vallière. The pretense became reality. Louise de la Vallière became the king's first officially acknowledged mistress. And because she refused to be separated from her greatest friend, Madame de Montesquieu, Louise saw Madame de Montesquieu every day, and in the fullness of time, Mademoiselle de la Vallière was out, and Madame de Montesquieu was in. And because she, Madame de Montesquieu, was at any rate for a time inseparable from her greatest friend, Madame Scarron, she too, in the fullness of time, was out, and Madame Scarron was in. Mistresses, especially royal mistresses, seem in those days to have had an unwittingly generous side to their nature. Each one handed to the king her own successor on a plate. At any rate, on the evening of the divertissement in his father's hunting lodge, the king never took his eyes off the table where the future Madame la Marquise de Montespan and the then Madame Scarron, later to become Madame la Marquise de Maintenon, were enjoying themselves hugely. <laughs> they say he likes clever, amusing people. What he sees in Louis de la Vallière, I cannot think. She seemed duller than that play we just sat through, and that's saying a great deal. I mean, you must see something in her, dear. She's doing best to conceal the back of her pan. But she's obviously pregnant again. <laughs> well, of course she is. No ostrich could provide feathers for a fan large enough to conceal that. <laughs> and, and she had the vapor the other morning when taking mass. She said she had to remain seated throughout the service because of a slight growth in her left foot. <laughs> the growth, my dear, is in a very different place. I'm not so slight. Oh, I think, I think you'll be in vain. She's your best friend. No, she's nothing of the kind. I caught her friendship in order to be near the king. When I first came to the court eight years ago, I was maid of honor to the first madame. Well, you know what they say, dear. All his women come from his brother's household. It's the nurse in the garden of his mistresses. <laughs> he strolls round the garden picks the flowers of his choice and transplants them to his own bed or potting shed. And he picked not you, but another spring bloom from the garden La Vallière. Oh, at the time I found it extremely hard to bear. And she, by her present condition, clearly does not. Oh, of course, right there. <laughs> she will not, my dear, if I have anything to do with it, prove a hardy annual. <laughs> Room only to ask Lenotte, the gardener. Louis has notoriously bad taste in picking flowers. Oh, just look at her, my dear. She's so dull. Her eyes fill with tears whenever the king speaks abruptly to her. She blushes when one of her maids turns down the bed. But she is pregnant again. I wish you wouldn't keep harping on that subject. There's no need to draw attention to what is self-evident. Well, the fact is, Francoise... Ah, my name is Dr. Nice. It isn't, dear. You were baptized Francoise as I was. <laughs> and I changed my name to Atenais. Why? Because there may be more than one Francoise in the king's life. Oh, not you, dear. I'm sure of that. But there is only going to be one Atenais. Well, in spite of the fact that he's staring at you at this moment, or it may be he's staring at me. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He's never taken his eyes off me all evening. In spite of that, dear, you don't seem to be getting very far with him. Oh, I shall. And soon, I see signs of a flower he picked wilting. She may have another bud about to blossom, but his majesty's interest in the parent growth is waning. <laughs> All I need is a little spiritual assistance. You know, I believe in God. I know it in fact. Unfortunately, it is against the rules to ask him to assist in double the adultery. Double? You mean you already? I mean nothing of the sort. I am happily, contentedly, and respectably married to Monsieur de Montespan, and have been so for five years. No, no, I mean His Majesty. God will not approve of the king having as his official mistress both La Vallière and myself. Oh, that would not be right. You cannot ask God's help. To whom do you turn for advice? Probably Satan. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm serious. I believe in Satan just as much as I believe in God. If one refuses a prayer, the other may grant it. Even at the risk of hellfire. But first, I shall consult Madame Wallace. Madame Voisin was a fortune teller, a very fashionable fortune teller. She had an element of the Saint-Denis, 
where she numbered among her clientele and lovers many minor noblemen and the public executioner. She gave excellent advice to her clients, catering for little feminine desires such as larger breasts, smaller mouths, and better luck at cards. She had certain powers if anyone wished an inheritance, and various forms of magic for unrequited love. It all sounds absurd, as present-day fortune tellers may seem to many people, but she carried on her business most successfully in this way. For a time, she had no success at all with Madame de Montespan, who herself was having no success at all with the king. Nothing has happened, Madame Voisin. He remains completely indifferent to me. We must try spells. Which involves the, the devil? Oh, yes. He's there, you know, whether you like it or not. He's there, just oh. round the corner, with his dreadful fascination waiting to pounce. And you're prepared, Madame de Montespan, to... Take the risk. I have my life before me, Madame Voisin. I am not yet unduly preoccupied by the next world. My thoughts are centered on this one. I have been married five years. I have two children. The time has come to realize my ambition. And my ambition is to become the king's mistress. Very well. I know a priest. I, I thought you said this was a matter of the devil. Uh, this particular priest knows the devil intimately. Viva Pigeon's house, and as Chaz has been consecrated, you kneel and make the sign of the cross in front of his house, and then kiss the chalice. I shall now hold the holy gospel over your head. Will you pray, a child? Oh, please let the king love me. Let Monsieur Le Dauphin be my friend, and may this love and friendship last. Please let the Queen sterile, let the King leave La Valliere, and never look at her again. Let the Queen be repudiated, and the King marry me. Amen. It worked like a charm. Madame de Montespan became King's mistress, the Dauphin, then aged eight, loved her. Louise looks in the direction of Mademoiselle de La Valliere, became fewer and colder, though this did not prevent him from giving her another baby as a parting present. The only clause in Madame de Montespan's sacrilegious prayer was the one wishing for the Queen's sterility. She was far from that, and had six children, all of whom except the Dauphin died as children. Madame de Montespan, um, well, a prolific woman, was soon herself expecting. She had in all nine children by the King, or presumably by the King. The first, even before it was due, caused His Majesty anxiety. Your husband, Monsieur de Montespan, I don't think he approves of me. I do not understand it. So many other husbands whose wives have been, uh, how shall I put it, honored by the king have raised no objection. Indeed, many of them have built up enormous fortunes because of the favors I have bestowed upon their wives. Monsieur de Montespan is different. He is very different, sire. When he knew that we were um, lovers, he boxed my ears. Hard. Whenever I meet him, he contrives to bring David and Bathsheba into the conversation. And I thought it going a little too far when he went into mourning and began referring to you as his late wife. And one day last week, drove in his carriage to saint germain en laye with a pair of sags, horns, draped in black, wobbling about on the roof of his coach. You are not to concern yourself, sire. My husband and my parents talk the same language. All the same. When the child arrives, it must not be seen to arrive in public. Oh. Someone safe, reliable, must be found who will take it to birth and look after it secretly. Hmm. I know the very person, Madame Scarron. Madame Scarron was set up in a rather beautiful house between Paris and Bougira. It's still there, number 25, Boulevard de Montparnasse. Servants and all the necessary trimmings were laid on. And in due course, when the child, a girl, was born, it was smuggled out to Madame Scarron, waiting in the carriage. Despite Madame Scarron's care, the child very soon died. But it was followed, all swiftly, by two brothers, who later became Duke de Maine and the Comte de Vexa. And Madame Scarron, in her new role as governess, was now thoroughly enjoying herself. She moved around in Paris society, and no doubt her friends, who were real Parisians, no doubt they knew what role she was playing. They never mentioned it to her, they just noted that her plain, nun-like clothes, in the dark colors she always preferred, were now of the finest cloth and embroidered with real gold thread. They were not to know that this gentle little woman,
caring for the children of her best friend, was to become the king's next official mistress. On March 13th, 1679, Madame Boisin, who was a sort of uh, sideline to her fortune telling, had assisted in some 2,000 abortions, was arrested in Paris as she came out of church. On hearing the news, Madame de Montespan hurriedly left the court. The normal main topic of conversation in Paris society, the king's mistresses, now switched to something much less attractive or amusing, poison. To try to stop the rumours, and he hoped to stop the poisoning, Louis took action. With the man he had recently appointed chief of police, Monsieur Larigny. The atmosphere in Paris, Monsieur Larigny, is not good. It is evil. If your majesty will permit me to say so, sir, your parliament is elected to convert the French Protestants. By conversion is meant persecution. The atmosphere could hardly be expected to be good. I am not referring to the Protestants, Monsieur. I am referring to the poisoners. Ah, your predecessor, Monsieur Debray, was poisoned by his wife. Almost three years ago, Madame la Marquise de Brinvilliers, who was much given to good works, poisoned her father. It took her eight months, during which time she nursed him devotedly. She did the same for her two brothers and attempted to do the same for her husband. She also, Monsieur La Reine, killed off a great many people in hospitals. She visited the sick, sweetly and often, and tried out on them various poisons. As you know, she confessed. She was beheaded and then burnt in the open air. So that Madame de Sévigné once said, we are all breathing her now. This must stop, Monsieur Larini. You know I like winning wars. I do not like to do it by administering poison. To stop it, sire, may involve many persons close to the court. What do you mean by that? The tribunal you have set up, sire, has made many discoveries. There is a warrant out for the arrest of the Comtesse de Soissons. But she's a good friend of mine. She's one of the best card players in France. It is suggested, sire, that she played her cards well with her husband. He was in poison. There is also, sire, a warrant out for the arrest of the Duchesse de Bouillon. She is the most adorable woman, and she is the lover of my cousin. That is why, sire, they say she poisoned her husband. The charges, sire, have been phrased as tactfully as possible. The Duchesse de Bouillon is merely being charged with having tried to poison her husband's valet, who knew of her lover and knew about her hopes of poisoning her husband. I see. It clearly makes a difference. difference. Who else? The Marquise Dali, for poisoning her father-in-law. Did she? Oh, yes, Your Majesty. We have all the evidence. And um, one of Her Majesty the Queen's ladies-in-waiting, sire, the Princess de Pangri. What did she do? She poisoned her child, sire, with powders supplied by Madame Boissin. Anyone else? Many, sire. The Maréchal de Luxembourg, Madame de Polignac, many others. But this must stop. The tribunal must put an end to it. It must be made impossible to obtain these poisons. Um, no one uh, closely connected to me, apart from members of the court, is uh, concerned? That, Your Majesty, I would not be prepared to say. The tribunal, the Chambre Ardente, though weak-minded like many present-day tribunals, fished up some fascinating exchanges. Madame Chateaubriand, do you know Madame Boisin? Oh, yes. Have you taken her advice about spells and incantations, the devil? Certainly. She gives very good advice on these matters. And not only to me. To many others whose names might well surprise you. Have you seen the devil, Madame La Duchesse? And if so, what does he look like? Rather like you. Small, dark, and ugly. While all this was going on, Madame Scannon, the future Madame la Marquise de Maintenon, was establishing her position with the king. The young Duke de Maine, whom she adored, the first son of Louis and Madame de Montespan, wrote letters, oddly enough, not to her, but to Madame de Montespan. He had a paralyzed left leg, and he called himself Le Mignon. Berege, 1677. I was so happy, Belle Madame, when I saw that you had not forgotten your Mignon. You know how much I love getting letters from you, and I'm enchanted to have one in your beautiful handwriting. Pray, Madame, don't let the King forget Mignon. I want to ask you another favour. May they stop dressing me in skirts? 
I should walk much better. So I beg you to allow this bell, madame. So, there we were. The king's first son by Madame de Montesquieu being cared for by his father's future mistress. His present one growing fatter and grubbier and resorting to black magic and all manner of unsavory occupations to try to keep a hold on the king. And Madame de Maintenon, who was to replace that hold, beginning to set her own personal seal on the envelope of Versailles. Mademoiselle de la Vallée, oh, she left the court to become a Carmelite nun. She was 30. The young girl who had once been the very soul of Versailles, never had a suite of rooms in the chateau, and never saw it completed. As someone remarked later, the divertissement in the hunting lodge at Versailles, round which the envelope was built, embraced the past, the present, and the future. In The Sun King, based on the book by Nancy Mitford and adapted by Alan Melville, who was also the narrator, Aubrey Woods played the part of Louis XIV, Gudrun Yeur, Madame Scarron, and Elizabeth Morgan, Madame de Montespan. The part of the Comte d'Aubigné was played by William Edel, Dutch Envoy. Part one, an envelope containing poison. In the long life of Louis XIV, the Sun King, there were three main interests, women, war, and the Chateau of Versailles. He suffered a few minor setbacks with the first two. With the third, he created what, as a young man, he'd resolved to create, a chateau which would be the talk and the hub of the universe. The minor setbacks over women and war? Well, women. In the fullness of time, Madame de Montespan, one of his leading mistresses, grew disappointingly fat and blousy. And on getting out of her carriage to play her part in the siege of Gaunt in 1678, whatever part that was, was seen, in spite of two or three hours of massage each day, to have legs each the size of a comparatively thin man. She also became rather grubby. She also took energetically to religion, and in due course, she had to go. Madame la Marquise, you have become devout. I have, monsieur. Like my rival of the king's favors, Madame de Maintenon, I am filled with sadness and horror at the very sight of Versailles. This is what is called the world. This is where all the passions are at work. Love of money, ambition, envy, and dissipation. Oh, oh, how happy are those who have put the world behind them. Those being your views, madame, it will cause you no distress to learn that the king has given orders that you are to leave the apartment you occupy next to his here in Versailles. Monsieur le Cambiomier, why were you chosen to tell me this? I obey his majesty's orders, madame. And those of your sister, madame de Maintenon, who was once my friend, then my rival, and who has now taken my place as the king's mistress, or one of them. Madame la Marquise is aware of His Majesty's wishes, madame. Where am I to go? You are to be granted accommodation in the apartment of the Bang, madame. No doubt, because my enemies at the court say I do not approve of soap and water. Oh, God, I wish I were dead. I hope when that day comes, madame, you will have made sure of marrying God, not just living with him. <laughs> like your sister, monsieur, whom I brought to this court to look after the first son I had by the king, the Duc de Maine. He was born paralyzed in his left leg. She seems to have cured that, though he still walks with a limp. She seems to have succeeded in many other matters. When I spoke of marrying God, and you said, like my sister, what exactly did you mean, madame? Oh. To Madame de Maintenon, as to me, and, and to, to a great many others. The king was God. Uh, well, at least, and at last, Madame la Marquise de Maintenon and I have two things in common. And what are they, Madame? Mm -hmm. We both, Monsieur, have had the pleasure of being the king's mistress. And we both, Monsieur, have ended up suffering from migraine. And your sister, Monsieur, brought on mine. As for the occasional setbacks in war, 
Well, um, Holland irritated the king even more than the development of Madame la Marquise de Montespan's legs or her growing grubbiness. This ill-feeling no doubt began when Louis, as a very young man, offered his infant daughter Marie-Anne to be the wife of William of Orange and was snubbed. Sire, his royal highness Prince William of Orange, hereditary shareholder of the United Netherlands, says, um, um, well, says what? That in the House of Orange, one marries the legitimate daughters of kings, not their bastards. Thank you. You will be escorted back to Holland. When the time is right, I shall doubtless follow you. With my army. Louis, smarting for years after this rebuff, almost conquered Holland. Had he done so, no doubt he would have given the Dutch an unpleasant time. But when he and his army were within sight of Amsterdam, the Dutch opened their dike gates, and this uh, considerably dampened the expedition's ardour. In a way, it's odd. The king's favourite flower was the tulip, and when he wasn't actually fighting the Dutch, he ordered four million bulbs a year from their nurseries for his new gardens in Versailles. And there were certainly no setbacks in his plans for the Chateau of Versailles. Quarrels, disagreements, changes of plans, yes. But in his early twenties, Louis had resolved that what had been his father's little hunting lodge would be transformed into the most glorious chateau in France. The resolve may well have first come to him when, at the age of 23, he was invited to a housewarming party given in his honour by Nicolas Fouquet. It was uh, quite a housewarming party. There were 6,000 guests. I have never known such an occasion. Oh, such opulence! How can Monsieur Fouquet afford it? He is more than adequately married. He would require to be to pay for all this. He married Marie de Castille only ten years ago. She was very wealthy then, and it's said that in those ten years Fouquet has tripled her wealth. When one thinks of it, the last time I drove past here in my carriage, what is the place called? No, Belle Vicomte. It was green fields and cattle and a few peasants, miserable little cottages. Compliments and of Mr. Fouquet, madame. Oh, I beg your pardon? Uh, with the compliments of Mr. Fouquet, madame. Oh, it's a diamond tiara. The one of the most beautiful I have ever seen. Uh, Mr. Fouquet will be extremely pleasant, madame. Uh, madame, uh, with the compliments of Mr. Fouquet. Oh, you mean we're all being presented with diamond tiaras? Uh, Mr. Fouquet, Fouquet, madame, is anxious to make his first reception a memorable occasion for his guests. The gentleman guest star, I presume, as is the custom, ignore. Uh, no, Mr. Fouquet, on leaving when naturally carriages have been provided for you all, you will be presented with a thoroughbred. A thoroughbred for Sterling, Mr. Fouquet. Uh, Mr. Fouquet acquired them from one of the most famous studs in Arabia. He has arranged for grooms to conduct them to wherever you wish them to be seen. Uh, Madame, with the compliments of Mr. Fouquet. Words fail me. And that, my dear Charles, has not happened to you for a very long time. Uh, uh, Look, Fouquet is showing his majesty some of his treasures. I cannot decide whether the king is impressed or just saying. <laughs> The Italian influence, Your Majesty. No, but for the first time, have you blended with the best in contemporary French taste? No one, sire, is more proud to be French or to be one of Your Majesty's most devoted subjects than I. But I feel in art we can learn much from the Italians. Now, this, Your Majesty, is by Giotto. It cost naturally a great deal of money. <laughs> Very beautiful. And the various marbles, Your Majesty, these covering the ballroom floor are from Kerala, and those below the balcony come from India, a quarry in Makran. Your Majesty approves? His Majesty said, no doubt partly under his breath, looks, looks, and so on, il Meaning that the whole thing was all very splendid, but ostentatious and more than a little common. He then got down to business, and even as a young man, he could be extremely... <laughs>